Hello everybody and welcome back to episode 14 of the video stream in which we program an entire video game from scratch from beginning to end using no engines and almost no libraries using just our brain power and the C programming language. So last time we finished we were still working on uh, this stuff right here we we got um, handle count and memory usage and average CPU usage uh, baked into our uh, game now they're shown in our debugging uh, display if you will um, I'm going to go ahead and start out by saying that I give up I've given up and I no longer have any hope that we are going to be able to do this without modifying the global Windows system timer resolution. I really wanted to, I thought we were going to uh, be able to achieve uh, good CPU utilization and good steady FPS without modifying the global system timer, um, but I just don't think you can. I just don't think it's possible. And I'll, I'll show you why. Um, let's see. So let's say that here is our uh, here is our frame, and here is zero milliseconds, and here is sixteen point six two five milliseconds. Now this is our entire frame right here. Let's say I let's say I, I it takes it takes me this long uh, to finish drawing the frame. So I have all this time over here, but if my global system timer resolution is 15 something milliseconds, then even sleeping just once, just once puts me like right about there. And yeah, so I've already missed uh, the next frame. Right? Can't do it. Um, and there's just no way to make it work. So what happens is, is that if my uh, timer resolution is like 15 milliseconds, then basically I essentially never, I can't afford to sleep. I can never sleep. So CPU usage stays pegged, uh, stays spiked at 100% and there's no way around it. So I just can't, I just can't with this. I give up. So uh, with that being said, we are going to go ahead and say system info. Oh, and actually, uh, one thing I'm going to do first is I'm going to go ahead and get the system time once at the very beginning uh, of our startup stuff before we've had any time to, before we've entered our loop, I'm going to go ahead and get the uh, current system time, and then I'm going to go ahead and store that in our gperformancedata.previous system time. Uh, that way, uh, by the time we get into our uh, main loop, we will already have a previous system time to compare to so that we can ha get our CPU usage calculation up and running uh, faster, uh, like two seconds faster. So, um, okay, so what I was saying earlier is, I guess I'll make it right here, uh, time begin period one so now with this function the time again period function I'm asking Windows hey if it's not already set to one millisecond or lower can you please set the timer resolution to one millisecond for me if time again period equals timer no can do 
And if we look up this function, time begin period. It will say that it returns time error no can do if the resolution is out of range. Um, and then also say things like, um, you know, don't forget to set the timer resolution back to what it was before. Um, but we don't have to worry about that because the timer resolution is going to stay one millisecond no matter what throughout the entire uh, lifetime of the game and, and just like with the uh, memory and with everything else you don't have to worry about cleaning it up Windows will automatically reset the timer back to what it was before when your process or when this game exits so we don't have to worry about setting it back um, let's see alright <laughs> Failed to set global timer resolu resolution. Build errors, and it's going to tell me um, unresolved external symbol, and it's because I forgot to link something. I need to link this right here, winmm.lib, uh, short for multimedia. There's also, um, speaking of winmm.lib, there's some interesting uh, multimedia CPU scheduling or thread scheduling algorithms in this library that I might want to look at sometime as well, but not today. Uh, so I'm going to go back up here. I'm going to link this somewhere where it makes sense. Wow, I haven't linked anything yet, have I? Um, so I guess I'll link it right here after all of my includes. I do this with a, another precompiler directive, pragma comment lib, and then the name of the lib is winmm.lib. Now let's see what happens. All right, works fine. Um, Current time of resolution is one millisecond. It was already one millisecond before because some other, uh, because Visual Studio was already requesting one millisecond and OBS was already requesting one millisecond. Um, so it doesn't make any difference for us right now. But if you did want to test this, you would have to shut down. Um, you would have to shut down Microsoft Edge. You have to shut down Visual Studio. You have to shut down OBS, and then then go and launch your game and you'll see that the uh, your Windows uh, timer should have gone back up to 15 something milliseconds and then um, you will be you will experience the same dismay uh, that I did once you realize that you can never you'll never be able to achieve any sort of um, decent frame rate when your uh, system timer is that high um, I guess the only chance, the only other thing that we could try, which we're not going to do it today, and we may not ever do it, uh, but if we were to use uh, the graphics, um, uh, if we were to use something like our like DirectX is what I was what I was thinking of, if we were to use something like DirectX where we could actually uh, get a hold of the of the machine's real refresh rate of the monitor's actual refresh rate and get a um, get the real uh, v-blank or v-sync signal from the monitor we could um, theoretically synchronize to that and we could get a smooth uh, frame rate without having to rely on the uh, windows system timer but um, we're not going to do that because directx is um, not portable um, not that we're not already doing stuff here that is not portable, but if somewhere way down the road, if we wanted to port this to some other platform like Linux or Raspberry Pi, um, you know, or um, PlayStation or uh, something like that, uh, you couldn't use you know you couldn't use anything like DirectX. So I'm not even going to worry about it anyway. 
Uh, let's see, where was I? All right, so let's go ahead. Oh, and that reminds me, I also want to clean up this code right here, uh, where I have my player and I gave him a world position. Uh, and this actually is not his world position. Uh, this is his uh, screen position uh, because the, let's see, let's go back to this website. I knew I shouldn't have closed it. Uh, just like, imagine, imagine a game like Legend of Zelda where you've got the whole world, right? And then let's say you start right here. This is one screen. And then your little dude, uh, your little dude is right here. So his, his, your little guy's uh, screen position might be something like, you know, um, 50x and 20y or something like this. Um, but his overall uh, world coordinates are going to be something like, you know, 3000y or, you know, and if, he, and if, if he's over here, it's going to be something like, you know, 3000x and... 200Y or something like this. So your screen position and your world position are two entirely different things was, is what I was going for. So um, what I'm actually referring to right here is just I'm going over back to my player uh, data structure and I'm going to change this to screen position X and screen position Screen position X and screen position Y and okay. Screen. Screen. Screen, screen. Okay, still works fine. Now let's go fix something else. Did that. Um, we did that. We did that. I'm just checking my notes over here. Things that I wanted to fix. Um, here's something else that I wanted to fix. If I go down here to target, if I go to my pound define target microseconds per frame, I should write a little ULL here uh, that's short for unsigned long long, and it's just a way to tell the compiler, uh, to tell the C compiler that you are, I intend, I'm messing with an with a 64-bit uh, number here, and the reason for me doing that is so that when I go to my when I go to my code here it eliminates the need for didn't I have uh, didn't I have some I thought I already had. I thought I see. I thought I had. I thought I had some uh, some casts here, like right. Oh, there it is. Yeah, the, I thought I had one up there too. But like this right here, I should be able to get rid of this now. See, like before, I had to um, put this cast here in front of target microseconds per frame because C was assuming that it was a 32-bit number or a four-byte number and then it was like well you're doing some arithmetic where you're storing the value into a 64-bit number so basically it wanted me to if I was going to be uh, working with 64-bit numbers then I needed to be consistent in working with 64-bit numbers so I had to just make this cast here 
Anyway, I shouldn't have to do that anymore. Um, right, so... Let's see here. We are going to... I think I can just get rid of this entirely. And... Go back to the way it was originally. We'll see. This might, I think this will get us back to 57 FPS. 56, 57 FPS. And I don't know why it does that. Um, I feel like I should be getting 60 FPS. Uh, with that algorithm, but I'm not. So if I do something like this, where I say if if we are if we are less than 75% of the way through the frame, then uh, sleep. Otherwise, then just spin through that loop as fast as you can. Oh my bad. That's actually supposed to be a. It's supposed to be times 0.75 instead of divide. So I hit go and okay, 60 FPS steady and 2% CPU. So mwah, it's perfect. Uh, the idea is that we are, let me erase all this. We have our frame here. And again, this is zero milliseconds. This is 16667 or 16.667 milliseconds. And then we get to about, let's say this is 75% of the way through the frame. So because we have a really fast computer, we actually finish drawing the frame somewhere around here and then what ends up happening is is that we we sleep one here we sleep one here we sleep one here we sleep one here and then we finally get to about 75 of the way 75 percent of the way through the frame and then we start looping rapidly um, burning CPU at this point so and the reason we do that is to maintain uh, precision. When we get precisely to this point, we don't want to be sleeping or else we'll miss the beginning of the next frame. And we want to make sure that we get, uh, we, we want to make sure that we are responsive uh, by the time the next frame begins. Does that make sense? So. The only time that this algorithm wouldn't work is if we were on a really slow computer and it, it really took the computer uh, this much time to actually finish drawing the entire frame. Um, at that point, I think we would probably go back to, we would, we, we would still have our FPS, but we would probably go back to using 100% CPU again. Um, but at this point, I don't really care. So, all right, let's leave that. Um, next thing we needed to do is we needed to, I put a bunch of garbage in here that didn't need to be in here. And what I mean by that is um, I made a lot of these things globally accessible by putting them in this global data structure when in, in fact they did not need to be. A good example would be These would be two great examples. Uh, process creation time and process exit time. I'm going to go ahead and pull those out right now. And I'm going to put them back into the uh, win main function uh, so that they're accessible only. Um, let's see, process creation. Yeah. So that they're accessible only from within win main, which is fine. We've got to go back over here and fix. fix fix and um, I believe since the only 
value that I really care to have in the global game perf data data structure is CPU percent I don't think I need any of this in the global data structure either so I'm gonna pull all of these out and I haven't decided what I'm gonna do with system time there might be a situation where I want to use system time in somewhere in, in some other area of the game um, but I'm not sure yet um, one idea that comes to me is like I may want to have day and night cycles in the game where it actually depends on the the time of the like that the operating system has actually like if it's you know uh, 11 p.m. in real time for the player according to the player's computer then I'll make the game dark and maybe you know harder monsters come out at night and that kind of stuff um, but anyway before I get ahead of myself uh, let me put this back over here with the rest of these current user time, current kernel time, previous user, previous kernel yeah all that is fine I have to go clean up all this mess here and you know what the other thing I really like doing this is because um, this has the pleasant side effect of just cleaning up the code in general so it's not quite so sloppy so oh that's that not what I wanted to do Okay. see what happens. No, let's go find where I'm missing. Uninitialized, oh, uninitialized local variable. And the reason why it's telling me that, remember, is that I said that um, global variables are the only ones that are guaranteed to be initialized to zero. Local variables uh, you have to initialize them yourself, which I should have been doing all along. It's just a, it's just a good habit. File time is data structure. Yes, 60, and about 2% CPU. Oh, look, look, now my current timer resolution is 0 0.5 milliseconds. Or 0, yeah, 0 0.5 milliseconds. How about that? No idea why, uh, but fortunately it still works fine. So even though I requested, um, I requested 1 millisecond, uh, something else on the system, and who knows what it was, something else on the system has already requested uh, 0.5. So if the timer is less than what you request, then it's just going to use, Windows is going to use the the, the lowest uh, resolution that has been requested. So, All right, uh, let's see. One other thing I wanted to do is I want to hike up the priority of our, of our process 
So I think that's done with set priority class. Takes a handle. Mm. Ah, reminds me of something else I wanted to do. Somewhere in perf data, I think I'm going to put No, not there. Not there. But I am going to do this. Create a new local variable. Handle. Uh, process. Handle equals git. Current process. And then I can use it, I can use this process handle in various other places, like, uh, like, right here, and right here, and I feel like there's another one somewhere, isn't there? Search git current process. That one. Yeah. Just staring me right in the face. So now instead of calling a function three times, uh, we can just use a local variable. The same local variable should be fine. Uh, four times. Set priority class. There's our process handle. And then the process, the pri priority class will be something like uh, priority high, thread priority, process priority, mm, real time priority class. I don't want to use that one, do I? Above normal, below normal. I think I want to use above normal. I feel like there's probably a high though. Above normal priority class. Let's go look it up. Set priority class. <clears throat> okay, above normal, below normal, high priority process that performs time critical tasks that must be executed immediately. The threads of the process preempt the threads of normal or idle priority class processes. An example is the task list, blah, blah, blah. All right, so I feel like, oh, and real time is even higher than that. But of course, the reason that we want to avoid using the real time class is that, um, so they say, um, real time process priority class can actually preempt um, really really important threads that are um, important to the stability of the system and you don't want to get in the way of those threads you don't want to preempt um, uh, those really really important threads so I think as a best practice they tell you to stay away from the real-time uh, priority class Yeah, see, you can you can you can do things like uh, cause disk caches not to flush or cause the mouse to be unresponsive. You don't want to do that. So I think the highest you want to go is like high high priority class. And this says Tom Yeah, okay. Let's just use that. So there is a um, there is a process priority and a thread priority. Uh, Threads are the the actual I guess you could call them containers that that actually run your code, whereas a process a process doesn't actually do anything. So like when we say that a process is running, um, it's kind of a misnomer because processes don't actually run. Processes are just containers that hold one or more threads. The threads are what actually runs. The threads are what actually runs the code uh, that you write. Um, but you can set the priority of both your process and of your individual threads 
and the resulting the resulting priority of the thread ends up being a combination of um, the priority class uh, of the the priority of the process in which they in which the thread resides combined with the priority of the thread itself so with that being said I think I'm just going to set the process priority and let all the other you know what I take that back I'm not gonna do that I'm gonna set them both uh, what does it return if the function fails it returns zero okay so if that equals zero then fail to set process prior priority and set process priority and then secondly there is a set thread priority set thread priority which takes very similar it works very similarly and if you read all this stuff you will get um, all the details on how these priorities um, what they all mean and uh, how they interact with each other uh, and what it means to like combine the process priority with the thread priority um, you can also read um, there's a book called Windows Internals that if you care at all about how Windows works um, see Windows Internals 7th edition you should definitely uh, buy this book and read it um, yeah 7th seventh, seventh edition is the most recent one and only part one is out right now part two we've been waiting on for like three years um, but anyway it's a very good book and explains all these things um, for example all of the priorities that you can set on user mode processes and threads are all um, lower than um, kernel mode threads like kernel mode threads always have a higher priority than user mode threads um, at least I think that's true I might be thinking about interrupt request levels like all of your user mode code runs at um, passive uh, interrupt request level um, but anyway it's not important right now um, I wanted to set thread priority and what does it return if the function fails the return value is zero if set thread priority uh, get current thread and the priority is going to be what thread priority should I do should I do time critical let's just do highest All right, let's see what happens now. Okay, so all of that code worked fine, and we're not really going to notice um, any difference here, per se, but it is nice to know that if we are on a busy machine, at least we know that our process and our thread is going to, Windows will at least attempt to give it priority when it comes to uh, scheduling threads, because you know we are time critical here if I have you know if I have my frame like usual like I've been showing uh, so far 
and it comes time like let's say we're 75 percent of the way through the frame and let's like hey it's time to wake up now and run uh, we need to make sure that when we get to this point and we wake up Windows doesn't say oh there's actually another thread on the system that's more important than you and I need to let that thread run so I'm going to let your thread sleep for another indeterminate amount of time and by the time we finally do wake up uh, we're way out here somewhere because then we've missed our next frame the user ends up getting a choppy frame rate and um, it's just a bad experience for everybody so we don't want that so high priority threads high priority processes good stuff okay now let's move on to something totally different let me look and make sure I'm not missing anything Oh yeah, there is one other thing I wanted to do. Before we move on, uh, there's one other thing I wanted to do. I wanted to see how, um, you can see my mouse cursor moving. You see my mouse cursor moving around on the screen. Uh, we don't want that because this is going to be a full screen video game, um, you know, like old school Nintendo. It's not going to have any mouse interaction. So. We don't want this mouse cursor here at all. I don't even want to see it. Uh, so to do that, what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to go to I need to handle another window message, which we haven't we haven't revisited our window procedure in a long time. But remember, this is the callback function that handles the window messages for our main window. We're simply going to handle a new window message called WM Activate. And we are going to simply call show cursor false. So essentially when our window is quote unquote activated, or I think that's essentially analogous with um, our window receives focus, it's just going to hide the mouse cursor. So I think that's all we have to do. There, see now our mouse cursor is gone. And um, you, can't, you can't see it, but over here on my other, on my other screen, the mouse cursor is visible. Here you go. Here's another example. You can see that the mouse cursor is visible when I have it above other applications and whenever I have it down here on the taskbar. But whenever I hover over my game, the mouse cursor disappears, which is exactly what we want. So now I can check that off of our checklist. Simple as that. Now, the other problem. What's the other problem? The other problem is this. Now, notice when I use the arrow keys, I can move my, I can move my sprite around on the screen. Um, but then we have a problem. We're, we're on a multitasking operating system here. And notice, even when I have my, when I have my uh, web browser in the front here, I can still move my character around in the background. And that is not that's not what I want. I basically whenever the whenever another window comes into focus, I want to essentially pause my game. That way you don't have like because you know Windows is full of annoying nag screens and pop-ups. It's constantly interrupting you. You know, Xbox game bar will pop up out of nowhere. Your password will expire in 14 days. Do you want to change it now? You know, it's just like with Windows, you're constantly being bombarded with things popping up. And that's before you've installed like other software. You know, it just, it, the more stuff you install, it just gets worse. Everything is just constantly nagging you for your attention. So, we can uh, handle that in a couple ways. Number one, uh, in Windows there is a uh, what's known as a presentation mode, which I will probably enable, and it was specifically created, I'm sorry I'm doodling in the background while I'm talking, um, 
presentation mode was specifically created by the Windows developers uh, for people who are doing things like presenting a PowerPoint presentation at a really big important board meeting and they don't want to be interrupted then they that's why uh, PowerPoint will automatically enable presentation mode it's a generic Windows setting and I can use it to my advantage too uh, by enabling it on my game it should help things like um, these little windows pop-ups that you get uh, should be able to keep all those things in the background but I also want to make it so that if for some odd reason uh, the game does not have focus say you've alt tabbed out you wanted to go check your email you wanted to go do something else well I don't want the game to be sitting back here and like your your guy be, be moving around uh, on the screen uh, back here in the background while you are off doing something else in some other process alright so to do that what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to create another I'm going to create some sort of boolean variable to uh, let's see Um, window has focus and we're going to go back down to window procedure now and using the same uh, WM activate window message we're going to say if wparam equals zero that means that our window uh, has lost focus otherwise if w param is not zero then our window has gained focus our window has gained focus okay so I'm going to do g window has focus equals false here and g window has focus equals true here. Now, we may adjust this later, but the easiest way to handle this right now is to go to process player input. And what I think I will do. is if so if the window doesn't have focus then just don't process any player input whatsoever so let's see if uh, the code actually works now okay so moving along just fine now let's bring something else into focus here like our web browser and there we go looks like it's working fine I'm pressing the up and down arrow keys uh, which does scroll the web page but you'll see in the background our game is still running however it's not processing um, player input right now so our little guy our little sprite is not moving around on the screen which is perfect it's exactly what we wanted and I switch back and we can resume moving our character again okay so I think that concludes everything on my checklist of stuff that I wanted to do before we started our next um, really big fun awesome adventure which is uh, something I've been teasing you guys with for a long time now uh, bitmaps so we've got our little our little guy on the screen here which is a white square obviously um, unless we were making just like pong um, we're going to need something that looks a lot cooler than uh, white squares so to do that I want to load bitmaps from the file system and let's see what I have for us over here so our game I'm going to create a new folder here and I'm going to call it assets. These are going to be where our game assets go like bitmaps and um, music and sound effects. 
in like artwork and things like this. Uh, and let's see what else I've got here. Okay, I'm going to move this over here. This file, um, let me open it. Uh, yeah, open it with uh, paint.net. I really like paint.net. Um, okay, so this, as you can see, uh, is uh, some artwork. Of, it's a little, some little sprites. And it's a little dude, and you know he's got some walking animations, and he walks uh, to the left, and he walks upwards and downwards, and uh, you can you know like this you can flip that around, and then he he'll be walking to the right, um, and then over here um, you've got another he's he's wearing like different clothes, and then over here he's wearing like some real serious armor. So my idea was that you this would be our hero right here. This is going to be our hero. And then about a third of the way through the game, I haven't written the storyline yet or anything, but I'm just assuming that around a third of the way through the game, you're going to get or going to discover some sort of power up, the a new suit of armor which turns you into uh, this guy. And then two-thirds of the way through the game, you're going to discover some other power-up, some other suit of armor that's going to turn you into that guy. And I think uh, just about every other sprite that we have during the game is probably going to be some sort of different um, variation uh, on this kind of character. Um, you know, maybe some palette swapping, um, maybe, you know, a slightly different hairstyle, things like that. So I didn't, I didn't draw this. Um, I actually paid someone to draw the, to draw this for me. And, um, so I, I own this because I, I paid the artist money for it and, I'm probably going to have to end up paying someone else to do some more art for me uh, for this game before we're done because the programming of this video game doesn't worry me at all but artwork I'm not a very good artist so uh, you you if you if you um, read much about video game development or do much video game development um, you probably have heard the term uh, programmer art before, which is essentially um, programmers trying to be artists, uh, and it usually, you know, turns out looking like crap. So that's essentially what I'm trying to avoid here, is, um, you know, I'm not ashamed to uh, pay someone else to draw something cool for me uh, that I can use in my game. So anyway, this is going to be our little character. However, uh, I don't want to load a ping, a PNG uh, file. Um, and the reason why is because the PNG file format, I'm going to hit don't save on this, the PNG file format, while you can see it is very space efficient, notice that this file is only 4 kilobytes, it's very space efficient, but the PNG file format is actually very complex. It has a very complex compression algorithm uh, in it, and it's got like palette out, uh, it's got like a palette built into it that you have to decode and all this kind of stuff. Um, and that is um, not what I want to do. So here's what I actually want to do is I want to, oh, and let me let me bring this one over to you. Yeah, this is just work in progress, bro dude. This is, this is just some intermediate um, different kinds like See that I might have some other characters here that I could use, like this guy. He looks like a pretty cool guy, doesn't he? I definitely want to use him. Probably want to use him too. He looks like he's wearing like a one of those face helmets that you might wear in like a karate match or something. That's like a padded uh, face helmet, so that when you get hit in the face, it doesn't uh, break your jaw. Anyway. Uh, but no, what I actually want to use out are 32-bit uh, bitmaps. 32-bit uh, bitmaps are kind of a funny thing 
to want to use, especially on Windows. And the reason why is because of this. Let me copy this over here. Uh, hero underscore suit one underscore down, like he's facing down, and then this is his standing pose. Uh, I named it just like this. Notice that this uh, has a .bmpx file extension, uh, and I cannot open it by default. So if I choose, where is paint.net? I can't. Uh, let me just open paint.net here. Dang it. Paint.net. All right, so here's paint.net, and if I try to drag this file in here, it will say uh, this image type is not supported. On the other hand, if I open, if I use the classic Windows Paint, MS Paint, good old fashioned MS Paint, and now I do the same thing, I try to drag my 32 bit bitmap, it works. It actually works. So it works to the extent to where I can actually load the image, but MS Paint does not support a transparency layer. So these, uh, this white on the edge, uh, this white surrounding the character is actually supposed to be transparent, but MS Paint does not support transparency, so it basically just shows it as white, um, which is so, it's kind of weird that we have a paint program, MS Paint, that supports 32-bit bitmaps, but it does not support the uh, alpha channel or doesn't support transparency. Um, it's kind of weird. So what we're going to do is we are going to find, uh, let's see, let me find, I'm going to find my paint.net program directory. It's right here, paint.net. Now, if you go and install paint.net, there will be a file types subdirectory under uh, your paint.net installation. Let me find, let me go find, there we go. Now, if I copy this file into it, bmp32 paint.net file type .dll. Um, I found it back in 2015. Hopefully it's still available for you to go and download it. Uh, BMP32 paint.net file type .dll. Okay, forums.getpaint.net. Find a new version of this plugin here. Okay, so I think this is it. I think it's still, yeah, I can download it. Um, scan it, you know, scan it for viruses first. Uh, I'm not going to open it because I've already got a copy. So, you know, do, do, do that at your own risk. Um, make sure you run it through a, a virus scanner first. Uh, and in fact, if you don't have a virus scanner, virus total is your friend. Uh, upload it to here. Any file before you uh, install it, go ahead and run it through virustotal.com. It'll tell you if it's uh, relatively safe or not. Um, so anyway, once you have the DLL, uh, drop it in this file types subdirectory of paint.net. Then we can start paint.net and we can do what we were trying to do earlier. There we go. Drag this in here. Open. Now, we have just extended paint.net to have support for 32-bit bitmaps. And if you zoom in, you can see that it now appropriately shows this area outside of our sprite as transparent as opposed to uh, just being white. Now, if you were actually programming on a old school Nintendo or Super Nintendo, you would not use 32-bit bitmaps at all. Um, because 32-bit bitmaps, that's 
four bytes per bit. It's extremely inefficient in terms of space. However, it's extremely easy to work with uh, in terms of programming. Uh, the reason why it's so easy is because 32-bit bitmaps don't have any, they don't have palettes, they're just pure RGB data, or actually RGBA data, red, green, blue, alpha. So they're just pure pixel data. You don't have to worry about compression. You don't have to worry about palette indexes uh, and all these sorts of stuff. Um, extremely easy to work with. So on that note, how easy to work with are they? We kind of need to know. We're going to have to load this file from disk and store it in memory in our game which means we are going to have to have some knowledge of the bitmap file format. And it's going to be on Wikipedia. And essentially you're going to have you're going to want to read this entire article. Um, because it's exactly what I did and once you read this it becomes actually pretty easy. So let me see here. There's another tooling issue that I want to get out of the way. Another tooling issue. Um, I have, I want to open this file in Notepad. So I've opened this file in Notepad. Notice that you can tell it's a bitmap because it has a BM at the very beginning. Of the file, but there's a. Uh, I want to install a plugin for Notepad plus plus, and it's something hex hex editor or something or other. Uh, hex 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 hex. Really? What's it called? What's it called? So I have to look it up. Notepad plus plus hex editor plugin. It's called hex editor plugin. How do I install the Notepad plus plus hex editor plugin? Hex editor. So I'm, I wonder if maybe they just pulled it off of the the plugin manager. A B C D. I mean, it should just be right here, and I should be able to install it. I don't know why it's not. I don't know why it's not there. That really stinks. Well, if there's not one for Notepad++, then I'll just download this one because I know this one works fine. Um, Windows XP 2003 Vista 7, 8, 10. Oh yeah, let's download the Chinese version. Eng English. the difference. February 28th, 2020. That's version 2.4. That's version 2.4. I don't know what the difference is. I guess we'll just download that one. Scanning for viruses, it says. It's scanning really hard.
Okay, there's my hex editor. And now, let's close this. Go back over here. Did it add a context menu? No. HXD. Now I'm opening my 32 bit bitmap in a hex editor. All right. So now we can see um, every byte of the file, which will really come in handy when we go and start to uh, decode this uh, so that we can read it. Um, if you go back, if I go back to the uh, Wikipedia article, you'll see here that what we have to start doing is we have to start interpreting, okay, um, the first two bytes, which is four bytes total, uh, at like a two byte offset is going to be the size of the bitmap file in bytes. So let's test that theory. So if we take those two bytes, that should be four bytes, right? At an offset of two, should be the size of the bitmap file in bytes. So Let's do, uh, it's either going to be 3604 or it's going to be 0436. It, can, it might be backwards because of um, Indianness, but we'll see. 1078. So let's go see what the, let's go see how much it actually is. Not that. Users, right. Source, repos, game B, assets. How big actually is this file? One point oh five kilobytes or ten seventy eight bytes. It is exactly one thousand seventy eight bytes, which is the number we got right here, one thousand seventy eight. So it is true that if you go in a bitmap file, if you go uh, skip the first two bytes, because these these first two bytes are always going to be 42, 42 and 4D, right? Because those are the letters BM, and that is the signature that lets you know that this is a bitmap file. The next four bytes are going to be how big this file is. And sure enough, 1,078 bytes and 0436. 0436 is 1078. So yeah, that's perfectly correct. Now there's, if you keep going through this file and it will tell you um, all the other stuff that is the metadata uh, in this file. And once one thing that's really cool, and I don't know if I'm going over time here. I feel like I am. Yeah, I feel like I'm over time, um, but eventually there is actually a there is a bitmap info header data structure actually serialized inside this file. So at some point in my code, I'm going to be able to pick up a bitmap info header data structure out of this file and copy that directly into my code into a variable in my program and that's going to give me I better stop running this that's going to give me the um, you know bits per pixel it's going to give me the um, dimensions of the bitmap 16 pixels high by 16 pixels wide it's going to give me all sorts of information and this is what is really beautiful is going to uh, fit nicely into a game bitmap which we already have. Remember we're using a game bitmap data structure to represent our drawing surface, our back buffer, our canvas if you will. We can actually also use a game bitmap, the exact same game bitmap, to store all the other bitmaps that we're going to be loading in from disk. Uh, because we are going to be able to get this bitmap info directly out of the bitmap file and then we can take the rest of the bytes that are in that file 
and just allocate some memory for them in our program and load them straight into memory. And then we will have had we we will we will have loaded the bitmap uh, from disk into memory in our program and we'll be able to use it and just draw those pixels uh, shoot them out onto the screen so that's obviously we're gonna have to wait and do that next time because we're out of time so as always thank you for watching and if you have any comments please don't hesitate to leave your comments uh, on the video I will address them in the next one coming up in one of the next episodes coming up and um, don't forget that there is a um, github repository with all this code on it uh, all this code that you can use to follow along so um, with that uh, I am out and I will see you next time have a good one